Welcome to Relogia, where all disciplines connect via art, sci, tech, trilogues. Competition, synergy, constant search for composition, balance, harmony. They seek each other, lose each other, find each other. They form the experience. You design your experience and your experience designs you back. Team 2, Experience Design, Art Side Tech Trilogue 4. On the art chair, Professor Dr. Vladimir Nikitin, Philosophical Anthropology and Arts Therapy Department, Moscow Social Pedagogical Institute, Russia. Vladimir. Добрый день. Hello, Коллеги. I'm going to speak together with the interpreter. My English is not so good. Но я думаю, что мое сообщение будет вам крайне интересно. But I hope that my message will be quite interesting for you. Арт-терапия сегодня это очень бурно развивающаяся территория науки и искусства. Art therapy is a really actively uh, developing uh, sphere of science nowadays. И в России, и во всех странах мира искусство становится объектом uh, науки. Both in Russia and in other countries, uh, art becomes the part of science researches. Но вопрос, на каких принципах строится арт-терапия? But the question is, in which, on which basis что is лежит, art built? Что лежит в основе арт-терапии? What is the basis of art-therapy? Uh, я полагаю, что главный принцип — это принцип холизма. And I think that the main basis is the principle of holism. Мы сами, мы люди, являемся результатом холизма. We are, as humans, are the holism, as are a product of holism. And I want to display it for you. Uh, I want to ask you to do one thing, one task, which, I'm, uh, which I'll show you now. We are going to work a little with our hands. Let's try the right hand. Она идет ровно, спокойно. Your, take your right hand and just start to move it like that. Левая рука идет, например. And with the left hand, try to move like that. Правая рука поворачивает. Turn your right hand. Здесь не, нет, не нужно развивать мышцы. Это абсолютно когнитивное движение. You shouldn't Л use your muscles. It's absolutely cognitive uh, movement. Кто может дальше, пожалуйста. Try to improve these movements. Try to move your head. You can try to use your uh, leg and uh, beat. Это не выученное движение. Можем делать другие движения, пожалуйста, кистью. It's not learned movements. You can try to use your hand in another way. правой рукой, левой рукой. Try to move your right hand. Вращение другую сторону. Try to move some other movements with your head. Вращение коленом. With your legs. Можно делать огромное количество примеров. You can make any move you can. А почему я не могу это делать или я могу это делать? And why can't I move, do this? Or why can I move? Потому что мой мозг может координировать эти процессы на другом качественном уровне. Because my brain can coordinate these movements on, the, on different levels. Это не просто механика соединения движения. It's not just mechanics of uh, different movements. Это не алгоритм. It's an algorithm. Это иное качество, которое продуцирует мой мозг, мое сознание. It's another feature which creates my brain and my consciousness. Я думаю, проблема современной арт-терапии в том, I think that the problem of modern art therapy is that что не учитывается фактор нового качества. is that it doesn't perceive, perceive the fact of the new feature. Это не просто 
механическое повторение какого-то материала. It's not the mechanical, mechanical repetition of one material. Это формирование гармонии благодаря интуитивному действию художника. It's the creation of harmony due to the uh, new movements. Uh, современная арт-терапия имеет четыре направления. In modern art therapy, there are four spheres. Терапия визуально-пластическими художественными средствами. Therapy by visual, plastic and artistic means. Драматерапия. Драматерапия. Музыкальная терапия. Music therapy. И танцевально-двигательная терапия. Dance and moving therapy. Uh, я это называю иногда бебегунской терапией, терапией движения. Or therapy of moving. Вот, например, волна. For example, a wave. Каким образом она создается? Что это за движение? How does it create? How can I create this movement? Каким образом формируется движение? How does my brain create it? Это вопрос моего рационального сознания или вопрос моей интуиции? That's the question of my rational consciousness or of my uh, intu intuition. Пожалуйста, дальше. Mm -hmm. uh, мы исследуем работы разных художников. Работы разных художников. Uh, we research the arts of different uh, artists. Прекрасные работы Умберто Бачини. Here's the example of uh, Umberto Bacini. Они показывают, как создается образ на уровне интуиции. He shows how to create the image on the level of intuition. Движение — это некий качественный результат соединения элементов. Movement is the result of um, connecting the different details. Но это не просто соединение элементов. But it's not only the collection of the details. Uh, очень часто психологи, я психолог по образованию и психотерапевт по работе. Very often psychologist, uh, I am, he is uh, the psychologist by his education. Они в рисунках ищут проблему. Uh, psychologist in the uh, images are looking for the problem. Это дерево. Here is a tree. Оно вызывает разные у нас чувства. Uh, it calls different emotions in ourselves. Но если это дерево признак агрессии? But is this tree uh, images the aggression? Может быть, это признак нашей страсти? Or maybe it's our passion. It represents our passion. Очень важно учитывать вопросы феноменологии и экзистенциализма, смысла в жизни. We should take into account that uh, uh, pr the principles of phenomenology and, and existential issues. Пожалуйста, mm дальше. -hmm. Uh, я хочу показать на примере нашего великого художника Михаила Врубеля. I want to show the examples of works of Mikhail Rubel. Как меняется образ, когда меняется сознание? How does the image changes when the consciousness changes? Пожалуйста. Посмотрите uh, его работы. Uh, он увлекался работами uh, изображения демона. Uh, here is his work, uh, one of them is the seated demon. Но демон для uh, Врубеля это не демони, это не негативный герой. Demon for Rub Rubel isn't a negative person. Это падший ангел. It's a fallen angel. Который не может решить свои внутренние проблемы. Who can't solve his internal problems. В 1890 год мы видим красивого, здорового юношу. In 1890 we see healthy good um, young man. Mm. 1902 год поверженный демон. In 1902 we see the demon cast down. Мы с трудом различаем фрагменты его тела. We can see the parts of his body because they are disordered. Но здесь еще цвет. But here we can see some light. Есть интерес к образу. There is an interest to the image. Его последняя работа and his last work Шестикрылый Серафим is six winged seraphim Она трагична It's tragic Мы чувствуем смерть We feel the death Мы чувствуем страдания We feel the tortures Здесь нет жизни And here's no life Пожалуйста дальше uh, это мы посмотрели дальше И теперь посмотрим его работы еще дальше его автопортреты. Он рисовал свои автопортреты. Here are his self-portraits. 
1904 год он еще был относительно здоров. In 1904 he was kind of healthy. 1905 год, посмотрите его глаза. In 1905, uh, look at his eyes. Это глаз в си, в, взгляд в себя. It's a sight into itself. It's internal sight. Это страдание, непонимание, что с ним происходит. It's tortures and understanding of what's going on with him. И, пожалуйста, еще. И 1905 год он уже не способен нарисовать свое лицо. 1905, he can't depicture himself. Сегодня уже говорилось о том, что у нас есть право левого полушария. Today, uh, here have been mentioned that we have two hemispheres. По современным исследованиям в области нейропсихологии и нейрофизиологии, uh, оба полушария участвуют в создании образа. According to the modern researchers, both of the hemispheres uh, take part into the creating of an image. Тем не менее, мы можем говорить о том, что uh, у Врубеля доминировала левая полушарная However, структура. However, here we can talk that uh, In the, in the portrait of Rubel, the, да. the, left, the left hemisphere dominated. А право полушарие, оно менее было, менее было активно. And the right hemisphere was not that active. Мы видим, что разрушается uh, правая сторона uh, листа, за которую отвечает левая сторона листа, за которую отвечает право полушарие. We see how the left part of the image is destroying, and uh, it's a representation of the left hemisphere of his brain. То есть нарушается холистический принцип. The holistic principle uh, is distracted. Есть умение рисовать. You, uh, he can draw. Но нет способности представить целостный образ. But he can depict himself. Пожалуйста. Uh, это конкретный случай, uh, называется биполярное позитивное, uh, uh, аффективное расстройство. Here is the example of uh, bipolar affective disorder. Uh, я работал uh, с этим человеком. I worked with this person. Uh, посмотрите, мы видим очень драмати... Это образ себя. Here is the self-portrait. Женщина не имеет женского образа. Остались только красные губы. The woman doesn't have that woman image. Uh, the only thing she has is uh, red lips. И тогда вопрос к арт-терапевту. Где ресурс? Где возможность? And the question to the art therapist is, where is the motive? Where is the, how can we solve it? А возможность включается в этой ручке рамы окна. And the answer is in the handle of the window. Посмотрите, как она ее хорошо прорисовывает. Look how she depicted it in an, act, in an accurate way. Ее бессознательно ищет там ответ. She subconsciously looking for an answer in this handle. И это еще надежда на решение ее проблем. She has a hope to solve her problems. Дальше, пожалуйста. И мы видим ее же рисунок «Человек под дождем». Here's her other work, uh, a person on the rain. Она опять закрыта. She's again closed. Она не актуальна для себя как человек, как женщина. She, she can perceive herself as a woman, as a person at all. Главное, закрытый образ. It's a closed image. Напротив этот образ. And this image. Он противоречив. It's controversial. С точки зрения классической диагностики. From the point of view of traditional diagnosis. Мы можем сказать, что это агрессивный образ. We can say that it's an aggressive image. Но на самом деле это образ символ свободы. But it's an image of the freedom. Это действительно человек, который очень любит свободу и стремится к свободе. It's a person who loves freedom and who is going to it. Uh, один и тот же образ, разные диагнозы. The one image, but different diagnosis. Если мы не учитываем главную позицию смыслов, смыслы не учитываем. Uh, we doesn't perceive senses here. Uh, очень часто современная арт-терапия оперирует направляет свою терапию на краткосрочную терапию. Very often modern art therapy um, tries to work with short-term perspective. К вам приходит uh, человек с проблемой, и вы его вы сглаживаете проблему. A person comes to you, asks for a problem, uh, and you are trying to solve it in a short-term period. For Но если это терапия? But is it a therapy? Терапия, видимо, это когда проблема решена. Therapy is 
when the problem is solved for a, short, for a long period. В данном рисунке мы видим очень драматичный образ. In this picture we see a really dramatic image. Он наполнен эмоциями. It's full with emotions. И поэтому эмоции наш ресурс. And that's why uh, emotion is our resource. Пожалуйста, дальше. Uh, если мы говорим uh, о образе, if we are talking about the image, то мы должны понимать, что работают два типа мышления. Then we should understand that two types of consciousness are working. Сукцессивное и дивергентное. Successive and divergent. Они постоянно вступают в конфликт друг с другом. They are always in conflict with each other. They are always in, in cooperation. Я думаю, у Бачони прекрасный синтез этих двух позиций. Uh, Бачони is a perfect synthesis, a synthesis of uh, these two principles. Я опираясь на эти работы, я разработал методику десенсибилизации на основе работы Мунка. And uh, on the basis of these works, I have worked out the uh, approach of desensibilization. Десенсибилизация. Yes. Uh, Работы Эдварда Мунка uh, очень необычные. The works of Edward Munch are quite unusual. Они драматичны. They are dramatic. Но я думаю, они универсальны. But I think that they are universal. В его личной жизни было много проблем с женщинами. He had a lot of problems with women, with women in his uh, life. И он выражал их в картинах. And he tried to, in, he tried to depict them in his works. Я покажу вам конкретный случай моей практики с одной женщиной, которая имела семейную проблему. I'll show you the uh, concrete example of my uh, own experience with one woman. Да. Uh, я взял работы Мунка и выбрал те, которые, на мой взгляд, самые uh, продуктивные для решения проблемы. I have taken the Munch's works and uh, chose them according to the uh, problem. И вот их последовательность. Посмотрите, пожалуйста. Еще. Видите, меняется цвет, меняется содержание. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, here changes. Can you please turn back? No. Uh, когда, да. Thank you. Когда, когда uh, мы подбираем образы, when we are trying to mm -hmm. find uh, images, мы учитываем особенность данной личности. We are taking account, into account the types of, uh, of the person. Uh, в России люди очень эмоциональные. In, the, in Russia, people are really emotional. И очень чувственные. And really sensitive. И тема семьи крайне актуальна. And these themes are quite important. Поэтому очень важна последовательность образов. The uh, images are really important in this question. Последовательность. Которые, да, которые позволяют нам снять, снять эту проблему. Uh, can, uh, uh -huh. uh, еще? Еще? Стоп. Uh, вот чем завершается этот образный ряд. Это женщина, которая сама выбирает свою свободу и свой, делает свой выбор. This is how the story ended. It's a woman who chose her own freedom, who chose her life. И, и последний слайд. Вот... Uh, Uh, два рисунка этой женщины до работы и через полтора часа после работы. Here are the two images, two pictures. Uh, the first one is before the, war, the uh, therapy and the second one after an hour and a half after the therapy. Большое спасибо. Thank you very much. Dear audience, don't forget to look into the slide.do platform and log in with the hashtag Relogia01 to ask your questions. And also, if you see a question that you would ask yourself, to vote for it. Thank you. On the science chair. Ross Dodd, demonstration designer, Nokia Bell Labs, experiments in art and technology, Dublin, UK. Hello, thank you for having me here today. Let's see if I get these slides started. Hi. 
So, uh, my name is Ross Dowd. I'm an industrial and interaction designer working for Nokia Bell Labs. I work for the hardware innovation team based in Dublin, but I'm here today speaking on behalf of Experiments in Art and Technology, or the EAT. So, for those of you that don't know, the EAT is a division of Nokia Bell Labs solely devoted to the collaboration between artists and engineers. As Fathana mentioned at the beginning, it began in the 1960s, and it's still going strong today with collaborations happening between artists and engineers all over the globe. But yeah, and it's a real pride of Bell Labs. But yeah, in Bell Labs, it's our job to think about the future and to consider the whole picture, so that meaning societal as well as technological. And the thing is, while we work towards building the infrastructure to run the future, we should also have to think about how technology should be used to better humanity. And I stress should be used. So what I'd like to do in this talk is, I'd like to go through a couple of examples of how technology is developed today and the manner in which humans are meant to use it in a way that I feel de is dehumanizing. I then like to go through a couple of examples of the projects we do as artistic collaborators and show you how these, pro these um, artistic collaborations can be used to influence technology development. And my hope is that everyone in the audience here today, the artists, the engineers, the scientists, the technologists, that we'll all think a bit more closely about the steps we can take to ensure that humanity's future is human-centered. So, why consider humans anyway? So, coming from a design background myself, I thought I'd start off by pointing out why it's so important to consider the human dimension in the first place, by showing you what happens when you don't. So, I'm a fairly irregular member of a gym back in Dublin. Irregular is a pretty generous term. But um, during one of my longer stints away from the gym, I came back to find they replaced all the treadmills with these new devices. Um, I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. Now, I want, you to, I want to put you guys in my shoes. If you were to start this machine, where would you go? How would you start it? Does someone say green button? Um, that's a great guess. It's not really the answer. They actually want you to enter in all these different combinations and stuff. But you'd be forgiven for not knowing that because there's 29 buttons and eight displays on this one device which I think is just lunacy. It's akin to flying a space shuttle, not going for a run on a treadmill. But, and the issue here isn't the aesthetics or the ergonomics, it's that they lost the, the run of themselves. The thing is, they presented all these opportunities for complex interactions and functionality, but they forgot the end user. They wanted you to press how long you're gonna go for a run for and these kind of things. But in the end of the day, I've had a long commute, a long day of work. All I want to do is go for a run, but instead I'm made to solve a maths puzzle. And this may seem like a silly example because we all know what a treadmill is, what a treadmill does, and how it's meant to work. But I ask you this, what if this ill-conceived approach was applied to the emerging technologies that are bound to control our future? What if AOR, VR, robotics solutions are developed that create these equally alienating experiences? It's beyond counterintuitive. And I don't think this is me making a tangential point or a massive leap. The fact of the matter is, if this is how common designed objects treat their users in the current day, what happens when the cutting edge becomes commonplace? And what happens when these ill-conceived interactions hold more dominance in our lives? This is how it's designed today, and there's no, there's no reason it would ever change, is there? And the thing is, we're already seeing this seep into the next stage of technology. So this is a product uh, designed by a startup where you wear it in an open, open office space so you can speak freely and loudly. Now, I wouldn't call this a very uh, humanizing technology. This is another example. This is an iPhone case which you can store your, your uh, fork and your spoon in it. And you might be thinking, oh, that's practical, you know, now have one place to store all these things. But look how they expect you to use it. They expect you to consume your internet, uh, consume your content as you consume your food. So yeah, I just think it's a bit loony. The, the thing, that's the problem though. That's the problem with like, myself as designers, engineers, technologists, is that we often solve problems that don't really exist. Or we just overcomplicate things. And the real issue is that we don't think about the downstream consequences of the things we push out into the world. Which is where the collaboration with artists comes in. There are many reasons why Nokia Bell Labs collaborates with artists. But at the end of the day, it's just good practice. If you think about it, if we were to spend our time developing 
the communication technologies to be, developed, to be accepted by humanity. It just makes sense to work with artists who spend their whole lives devoted to studying the human condition, the human experience. It's a bit cliche, but you only need to visit an art gallery or perhaps look at your kid's drawing to realize that art is one of our purest forms of expression. And therefore, artists must be one of the people best suited to studying this human expression. So there are plenty of reasons why Nakoya Bell Labs collaborates with artists, but to keep it sweet, it allows us, our, allowing us to reassess our technology gives us a chance to create this truly divergent technology roadmap for the future. So what I'd like to do in this talk is take you through the top four macro technology terms you're gonna hear a lot about. That's VR, AR, robotics, haptics, and AI. I then like to look at them from our approach, how the EAT is approaching them from a humanist perspective. Now, given it's only 15 minutes, I don't have enough time to go through all the projects. It's just going to be a little glimpse into what we're doing. But if you have any further questions, you can either ask me in the trialogue session or use my contact details at the end. So, the first one I'd like to talk about is VR and AR. That's virtual reality and augmented reality. So, virtual reality is where you immerse yourself entirely in a digital world by wearing a headset. While augmented reality is where you apply a digital overlay to a view of the real world. So not the, I have a couple of examples of the hardware here, not the most humanizing of things. But yeah, there's a lot of focus at the moment on the technology, the hardware that's going to be used to develop these technologies. And that's fine, but they're kind of thinking about what we're going to do with it later. And that's also fine, but when you go in with this approach, this without considering what the, the real world applications are and the ramifications on society, you, end up in this, you could end up in this morally dubious space. I want to show you a quick video. Whoops. A video play? Hold on one second. Yeah, so this is a project called Hyperreality, and it depicts a future that is just saturated with digital noise. And it's a future that's only just around the corner unless we check our next steps. And it, it's not actually that much of a jump because it's the same saturated approach we've become accustomed to on our online social medias. But the thing is, when that line between the virtual reality and the real world starts to blur, that's when you get into this morally gray area. But the answer is pretty simple. I mean, isn't it? The technology is just a means to the end. It's the user experience that's the most valuable element. So what we have to think about is what are the human experiences we want to augment and experience in this new virtual world? This is the idea that the artist Lisa Park was looking at. She's an artist who works with the EAT. And she was interested in this fact that we've lost this physical sense of touch in our world, that we've become more connected to the technology in our lives. So she decided to flip it and create this immersive technology experience that was actually enhanced and augmented the more you touched and made contact in the real world. I'm just going to show you a small snippet from a video of ours. And so we're all standing. And then what happens? What's next? It's uh, just any physical interaction. So let's say if we are holding hands, sure. like skin to skin oh, contact. Oh, wow. Then, uh, it's blooming. Oh, it's so beautiful. And, uh, Another topic I'd like to discuss is robotics. Obviously, robotics are massively popular and they come all sorts of shapes and forms. I like the lipstick applying one. But um, yeah, robotics, it's no longer a matter of if, it's just a matter of when it's going to happen. Commonplace robotics in our society. Because why not? Robotics are very good at these repeatable, precise, labor-intensive jobs. There's no reason for them not to do it. But the question is, when technology like this, the robotics, comes, becomes commonplace, it asks, begs the question, what will our relationship be with it? Will we accept it? Will they replace us? Or could it be a mutually beneficial relationship? Could it be that by combining the best of technology 
with the best of humanity, you achieve something that's greater than the sum of the parts. This is the concept that Su Gwen Chung was exploring during her residency in the experiments in our technology group, that of human-robot collaboration. She was interested in the way we express complex data, and she wanted to express it with the use of robotics. So in this instance, Bell Labs Video Analytics from um, our motion engine, which you see in the exhibition hall downstairs, was applied to a complex junction in New York City. This data was then sent to a swarm of robots who interpreted and painted these patterns of traffic on the floor, which the artist responded by painting alongside them, and then they would respond in kind and augment their travels along the floor. I'm going to show you a small snippet from a video of ours. What I'm doing with Omnia for Omnia is I've collected, I've been calling it the biometrics of the city, but what it essentially is, is the general optical flow of the city through Bell Labs motion engine. And I've translated that behavior into robotic movement that functions as a gesturally motion on the canvas. When I first met Su Gwen, I loved the line of her art. And Ultimately, I don't think it's about the technology. I think that we, the technologists, facilitates the artist. And I'm learning something from them, and they're learning something from me. What makes collaboration really interesting is that there's a lot of give and take and vulnerability that's required in it, and a lot of trust. And it becomes a lot more than the work. It's about you know the energy between people and human and machine alike. And I think a lot of the work is reflective of that. What was very cool about this project was that it directly influenced the research at Bell Labs. So Bell Labs researchers were actually able to refine their sensing algorithms and find out new ways of expressing this complex data. Another topic I'd like to briefly touch upon is haptics. So the haptics is the idea of simulating touch within a virtual environment. And it's seen as one of the last obstacles to achieving truly immersive VR and AR which is unfortunate that the hardware currently looks like this. But yeah, what the EAT is doing is we're exploring haptics from a different avenue altogether. We're looking at whether haptics can be used to unlock new forms of empathic communication. Specifically, we're collaborating with this artist, Seth Cluett. In his research, he's focused on music, and he's looking at how music can be a very powerful means of emotion sharing. And in particular, we're interested in looking at these patterns of emotion sharing and seeing whether it's something we can integrate into our technology development. And within the area of music, he's researching, researching excuse me, haptics. Because if you think about it, haptics are built into instrumental music playing. When you play an instrument, you're feeling the feedback from the violin as you play it. So we, the thought was that if we could capture that and recreate it or augment it, could this be incorporated into future um, interactions and language processes. I'm going to show you a quick short snippet from a video of ours. It's with three roles. I come as a humanist who's deeply interested in the nature of communication. The second is as a technologist who's trying to think about how can I decrease the friction between a thing that allows someone to be expressive and the expressive intent on the other side. The last is as a creative practitioner who wants to find a way to express myself through technology. Lastly, I'd like to talk about artificial intelligence, or AI. So there's a lot of discourse around AI at the moment, and unfortunately, a lot of negative discourse that comes from people not knowing what they're talking about, not knowing the proper use cases of AI, or thinking that it's going to give rise to a generation of angry terminators, like you see here. But the thing is, Within the EAT, we're looking at it from a different perspective. We're looking at whether AI can be used creatively, and we're looking at it as a collaborative tool. And I mean collaborative, as in a tool that learns from its user as you learn from it. This is a collaboration we carried out last year with an artist called Reaps One, who's a world-renowned beatboxer. So as part of a documentary series called We Speak Music, Reaps One created an AI digital twin of himself which he then trained to beatbox using machine learning algorithms. 
The series then culminated in him beatboxing versus his AI vocal twin. Here's a short snippet from the series. One second. <laughs> This is my favorite photo from the video because you can see how spooked he is. This is where the AI beatbox back at him, something he'd never thought of before doing, but that he's fully capable of doing. And he realized the creative potential of artificial intelligence. So the thing is, if AI can teach someone who's one of the best in their fields to enhance their practice, how can it teach us to be more creative? So I hope I gave you an overview of some of the projects we're doing at Bell Labs. If you want to check them out in further detail, check the website or come talk to me. Just to wrap everything up, I'd like to point out that everything shown here today, it's not the answer to all future interactions. It's not. I might get in trouble with my boss for saying that, but it's not. The fact of the matter is, these artistic collaborations, they allow us to look at human to human and human to technology interactions and really deep dive into them and see what they're about on a fundamental level. And by doing that, we can apply these insights to our research and technology development. Because I truly believe that only by rediscovering what makes us so human in the first place can we design a future that's shaped to fit us. Thank you. On the text. Now, dear audience, please don't forget to log in into the Slido platform, slido.do, log in with the hashtag relogia01 and uh, ask your questions or vote for questions you would like to ask yourself. Thank you. On the tech chair, Ari Peralta, innovator and serial entrepreneur. Arigami, London, UK. Good evening, Bulgaria, and thank you for having us here. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you to uh, Svet, Svetana, and the entire team. Also to the Honorable Ministry of Education, of Science and Culture, uh, for expanding the conversation and getting some of us to uh, come all the way here to Bulgaria and share some of the progress we're making elsewhere. I'm from this little tiny half of an island called the Dominican Republic. And some of you may know the Dominican because of its amazing beaches, uh, but that's not that all that refrains or uh, describes the Dominican Republic. When it comes to education, uh, this is something that is a worldwide issue. And when we're talking about how to integrate science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, this is not a Bulgarian issue. This is not a European Union issue or a Dominican issue. It is a worldwide global issue. And together we can figure out ways uh, to integrate new areas of science, new areas of technology, and really embed it into our culture, into our society. Uh, growing up, I, I studied business, so I'm an MBA, uh, but somehow I always had this affinity for science. Uh, I loved robotics, and still to this day, I coach uh, young girls on robotics. Uh, but the whole idea is how do we expand our minds? Because this STEM integration issue, this education issue, this sustainability issue, all these complex issues aren't new, and they aren't a situation or a problem that is siloed to one generation. This is a multi-generational issue. When we're talking about STEM and STEAM, we need to think beyond just our students. Because this is what I see a lot happening. We're talking about all these great programs, all these amazing efforts uh, within students, which is great. But there's teachers, there's parents, 
there's grandparents, there's businesses, there's other stakeholders, including policy advisors, that all need to be part of this movement together for it to be actually effective and for us to really feel the impact of its solutions. I wanna share the journey in as personal a way as I can because awakening that curiosity, awakening that desire to work and collaborate together comes through self-discovery. I was quite uh, inspired by many of today's uh, speakers who shared that personal element. Um, just to give you an idea, this is my fifth startup with Aragami. Um, I started my first one at 17. And uh, it's, it's been an incredible journey. And it's been 17 years of business trying to understand what is success. And the first thing I can tell you from my journey is that it's non-existent. It's a cycle of iteration, of experimentation. And when we look at success and failure and we bunch it together, it's actually the same thing. And when we're talking about how to integrate science technology, engineering, arts, and math, uh, we have to also focus on how to integrate each one of those areas. I talk a lot to scientists from around the world, and there's different branches of science. It's not that easy to just say science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, because just within science, there's various fields. I want to share some of the progress that has happened because of determination because of collaboration, and because of the sense of always being open to learn and to do more. I've had a quite a successful career for the last 17 years, but that word doesn't exist in my vocabulary anymore, success. So what is success to me now? This used to be what I thought success was, and I'm very grateful for all these opportunities, but success is every single life we touch for the better. In a day and age where we're talking about technology and we're talking about being connected more than ever, it's really semantics. It's because we plug in technology, but that's not true connection. Human connection is something that we really need to start rethinking, reinvesting. And with the rise of solutions like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, we have the perfect opportunity and reason and motivation to redefine what it is to be human. Let me show you a little bit about what we're doing at Aragami. I think there's supposed to be some audio to this. If not, I can narrate it for you. At Aragami, we are working across disciplines. We yeah, are exploring how to bring together. We are more anxious than ever before. The abundance of self-care doesn't seem to be shielding anyone from an endless list of stressors, from financial insecurity to job instability. Anxiety is caused by external circumstances and internal behavior. So how can we do better? How can we work together to find new solutions? If we design from the inside out, beginning with the psychological effects of the environment, working our way towards the immediate space around the body, then towards the elements of the building system itself, and onto the wider built environment, we can actually generate experiences across multiple places and for different purposes and users. At Aragami, we are bringing people together from diverse backgrounds, from across disciplines, leading a new way of thinking, better solutions, and faster progress. We need to pursue interdisciplinary collaboration more than ever before, because innovation does not happen on its own. Welcome to the future of wellness. Innovation does not happen on its own. It happens through teamwork. It happens through engagement. It happens through cross-pollinated training. And what we're doing at Aragami is working across different industries, across different fields, bringing innovation towards the next stage, which is implementation. Some of the major companies that we work with, which are quite recognizable, including McDonald's, including Marriott International. Some of these multi-billion dollar brands have amazing innovation departments and they're coming up with great things. Unfortunately, this innovation stays somehow uh, sequestered in a closet somewhere and it's not making it into our homes, into our schools, into our restaurants, into our conference centers. And we set out to take one task, 
How can we unfold the senses, the human senses? Tomorrow I'm going to be doing a workshop talking about the senses, so I encourage you to come, uh, because I'm going to demystify and debunk a lot of uh, things that we need to unlearn. And I think that's a crucial step as we move forward. We have to unlearn a lot of what we think we know, open up our minds and relearn. So this presentation is going to focus on interdisciplinary teams, and specifically, I wanted to dive into um, some of the best practices um, that we have learned along the way working across disciplines. I had changed this presentation last night. Um, unlike many of the colleagues who have shared some of the incredible and inspiring projects that they've done, I, I wanted to get more into how do you achieve those projects? It's very nice to show very fancy videos and, and neat technologies and how they're progressing, but what is happening behind the scenes to achieve that? You are not defined by your discipline. That is the first best practice we can talk about. This idea of token experts is something of the past, yet it is something that is still the main structure in our government, the main structure in our business, and the main structure in academia. We need to understand that solutions to complex problems are going to be complex solutions, not just singular solutions. So the more we get involved, the more we engage in and transfer information, the better we can actually achieve that. This idea of building this puzzle together is back to that human-centric design our previous presenter talked about. We've talked about human-centered approach for decades now. Yet somehow, despite as many self-help books, despite all the TED Talks, despite all the resources and, and medicines and all these other efforts, we are more stressed than ever. We're less happier than ever. And I have some really disturbing news to share with you. We're actually now living less than before. Last year marked the first year life expectancy went down. So all these solutions we think are working are not. It doesn't mean we have to place the blame game. It means to be successful. In other words, to create objectives that we can actually meet, iterate, and continuously improve upon, we're going to need to open our minds a bit more. We need to create a new language. The importance of language is that it brings us together. It gives us a common vocabulary so that we can move forward. And if we're going to start aiming for validated solutions right in between, we're going to need to understand the desirable aspects of human nature. We're going to need to understand the feasibility of the technologies. And most importantly, we're going to need to understand how business works and whether these solutions are viable to be implemented into their infrastructures. We talk a lot about how overwhelmed we are. The case in study is we are experiencing constant sensory overload. And the better we understand the senses, the better we can reduce this noise, optimize our environments, and live to our fullest human potential. We need to redefine our approach to research. And that's a theme that you've heard across different speakers today. Research currently follows a very linear approach. And let me explain what I mean by that. We start with a problem, okay? We're gonna research that problem, great. Okay, we have a solution to that problem, yet time has elapsed. So there's new problems right here. And suddenly we're constantly chasing ourselves back and back and forth. And it's because we're following a linear approach to education, a linear approach to research, and a linear approach to business. And we keep hearing in business, circular economy, but that's the only place we're talking about circular. This idea of a spherical element on how we reproduce information, how we exchange information, and most importantly, how we transfer that information, needs to become more ecosystem driven. We're sitting in a moment of a technological revolution within research. And wearable technology is transforming how we find solutions. So before, we used to do a lot of research, still do, in labs, many of which you saw from previous uh, uh, presentations throughout the day. But now with wearable technologies, we can actually take the lab out of the lab and into reality. 
wearable technologies allows us to reduce the friction with the unknowns uh, in research we call traditional research in vitro, kind of like a beaker. I always think of like a human running on a, on a little mouse treadmill. But ultimately, what we have the opportunity to do now is measure and quantify all these previous studies we've done. Most research itself is biased. Most scientific research we have still to this day is based on men. So we don't know much about women, believe it or not. And it's also mostly based on college students. So we don't know much about all the other generations that form part of this change we need to make. I want you to trust your curiosity. You know, this idea that we know everything, it's never the case. And it's only when we have this curiosity beyond the field of expertise of what we know is when we come up with solutions. Some of the best solutions that have been discussed here didn't come from the lab, didn't come from the artist, didn't come from the technologist. It came from their interactions together. We have some amazing ways to capture how our brain works. And the more we work together, assisted with technology, but driven by human-centric elements and benefits, we seem to keep forgetting that technology exists to help us. We don't exist to help technology. And we have time to steer it in the right direction. We need to understand that we have to also respect other fields. So one of the best practices that I've learned along this way is that <clears throat> when you're a scientist, you have to be open beyond your set of processes to understand the ambiguity and complexity and freedom that is art. On the art side, we understand you like flexible and freedom, but sometimes a lot of these scientific processes can allow you to repeat certain benefits and outcomes. By working together, we're not talking about lining experts together. We're talking about engaging and converging information. This opportunity we have now with technology, with science, and with so many other collaborators in the giant umbrella that is art is giving us a new way to understand data, to explore data. But I don't care about that. I care about people. How are we using this data to make our lives better? And I do believe that we can find a center where we align what are the business's goals, right? Every business wants to make more money and grow. We can do that in a responsible way. We can do that in a sustainable way. And most importantly, we can do that in a healthier way. We need to build a bridge forward. And that bridge forward starts with everyone in this room. The fact that we're here, the fact that the Relogia team has created a new platform, a new way for us to discuss and engage with this, this is just the beginning. And I want us to focus on building a bridge that isn't just for a splash, for a PR moment. It's something that ripples. And when you look at ripples in the water, it connects with more ripples. And suddenly, it's an ecosystem of ripples. This isn't going to be easy. And it's not going to be won over by placing blame on either side. It's how do we grow from our common ground. And similar to you here in Bulgaria, I'm from the Dominican. I know what it's like to have many changes. But I also know what it's like to have no other option but success because we're going to make it work no matter what. And that's a mindset of abundance. And not everyone has the opportunity in the world to have a mindset of abundance because they're too worried with everything they have. But I'll tell you what, when you have that drive within you to build that bridge, we don't do it for ourselves. We do it for our families, for our communities, for the things that actually count. I want to show you what the future can look like so that you can envision how we're presenting this, not just to our clients, but also to you humans.
We are organic beings. We are a reflection of our environment and of the beautiful nature, including this beautiful city, by the way, full of beautiful nature. This is what we need to bring, that holistic approach. I think where I want to touch upon one of the last best practices is continue to learn more. Keep learning more. It's never going to end. And I want to show you an opportunity where we still have to learn more. Today, we've mentioned a lot on AI and machine learning. In fact, neural networks in the brain have inspired neural networks, how we do it with computing. But I want to share an interesting fact that most data scientists I've ever spoken to, including some of the leaders at Google and Microsoft, don't know this fact. We have not mapped the human brain in its entirety. In fact, we have not mapped the brain of any living being except for one. And that is a worm the size of your hair. That's it. We have a lot to learn. And with these three communities coming together, we can actually take these elements from this static, uh, static element of how we receive information to a dynamic element where we can make data, information, our environment, our spaces, our offices, the ways we communicate, our mobility, even space, much more dynamic. We're sitting in a revolution with the senses. And when I started learning about the senses, it opened uh, this locked door that I didn't really quite understand. We have much more than just our five base organ senses. And again, I encourage you to come to the workshop to learn more. But we can use the senses to really fine tune and reduce the sensory overload and optimize function specific environments. I wanna play this quick video, uh, to hopefully inspire you researchers, technologists and artists on how to better work together. And most importantly, how to get support from the policy advisors, grant makers and others who are also stakeholders in this process. Working together is a key part of solving challenges in science. Now, more than ever, researchers are collaborating in teams, bringing together diverse groups of experts to find answers to contemporary global problems. The benefits of collaboration to scientific progress are clear, but the academic community is still failing to encourage and reward those working in teams. We've engaged with a wide range of researchers, funders, employers and publishers and found that issues of career development and a lack of recognition can impact on individuals when they work in teams. Biomedical research is rooted in a tradition of individual and small team scholarship with an emphasis on leadership and independence. But as research is done increasingly by teams, academia must embrace a fundamental change in its approach. We are calling for improved information about the contributions of individual team members and for that information to be used and valued in assessment. As well as providing better information about the contributions of individuals, we've identified four key areas to help researchers feel valued and progress in their career. Funding opportunities should be both flexible and generous, allowing for the long timescales needed to build and coordinate teams. To ensure that funding opportunities are accessible for those undertaking team science projects, funders should regularly review the balance, flexibility, length and magnitude of support they offer. Team members should also have access to focused and appropriate training in skills such as networking, leadership and management at all career stages, with funders, employers and researchers working together to develop nationally recognised schemes. All researchers should agree on milestones, credit and responsibilities throughout the project. Skills specialists, i.e. those working to support aspects of the research process or who manage core research facilities and equipment, are in particular need of clear, well-supported career paths. Employers should actively manage skills specialists to help them deliver collaborative science. And researchers should make sure that skills specialist staff are fully acknowledged for their contributions. All stakeholders need to work together to ensure that those who participate are recognised, trained, rewarded and supported. There's a lot of elements to change and we keep talking about change. But what is innovation in reference to change? Innovation is when change isn't good enough and we're forced to do better with less and faster time. 
I, I see this beautiful future here in Bulgaria. Because technology has given us the chance, just like it's given us in the Dominican Republic and elsewhere, the opportunity to level the playing ground. It's no longer about being how rich this country is or how not rich it is. It's how talented is your resource pool. And what the beauty of technology for me is, it gives us all access, a chance to get there in the world stage and make a difference. I never thought that this kid from the Dominican Republic would be speaking at NASA or at US Congress or an advisor to the UK Parliament. You can do that too. Your children can do that too. Your parents can do that as well. Thank you. Team two, experience design. Art, Sci, Tech, Trilogue, 4. Dear audience, due to running out of time, we will have, we will choose one question. I think the most universal one, which aims equally at all speakers, and hopefully it will lead to discussion, which will answer all the other questions. There are, in fact, three questions which are saying almost the same thing. I'll read one of them. Are we complicating life through technology rather than simplifying it? And are we losing ourselves and our nature as human beings in the process? I'll go ahead and start uh, real quick. I recently taught a class in uh, London on the evolution of mankind and technology. I wanted to explore where did automation begin? And I have a, a, an interesting point to make. In, 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 automation began when caveman grabbed a stone and threw it. We actually haven't let go of it in our hands. This idea of creating tools that extend our abilities as humans is something innate to us as humans. I think where we're advancing and evolving is how do we make these tools as frictionless as possible and as healthy as possible. Yeah, I agree with that entirely, that idea of frictionless as possible. Um, you know, we, 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 we still need for technology, as long as we still have needs and things we need to ac accomplish. The problem is that with technology, with the introduction of technology and digitization of things, we're actually at a junction now where the function is removed from what the form of something is, just to bring it to from a design perspective. It used to be that if you needed, for example, a chair is defined by, if you need to sit, you can see that the function is there within a chair. But if you look at technology now, it's down to you're at the mercy of the researchers, the engineers, the UX team on how this thing is going to help and augment your life. It's no longer black and white how these things are going to help us. So it's, we have to make that extra effort to make sure that everything is... Um, intuitive and human focused. Для меня этот вопрос вызывает двойственное чувство. For me it's a really controversial question. Очевидно, что технологии упрощают жизнь. It's obvious that technologies make uh, make our lives easier. Но те ресурсы, которые мы используем для технологий, but the resources which we use for creating new technologies, мы не используем для работы с собой. We don't use them for working with ourselves. Мы не учитываем наш природный потенциал. We don't take into account our nature resources. Шри Рабинда говорил, Шри Аврабинда говорил, что человек уже совершенен в этом теле. Шри Аврабинда. Said that uh, the human is perfect in his body. Ему нужно только научиться управлять собой. And the only thing which he has to do, he or she has to do, is to uh, try as to learn how to use it. Важно, чтобы технологии не заменили нашу способность к саморегуляции. It's important for technologies not to replace uh, our skills to create ourselves. Иначе мы превратимся в роботов. Or we'll become robots. And, and I just want to add and counter that a little bit in health of this discussion. Uh, I, I kindly disagree with that. I, I, I agree that we have to be sensitive to how we apply technology but we wouldn't have made it out of the cave 
if we couldn't create fire, if we couldn't add a stick to that stone and throw it further. This idea of creating tools that extend our ability is something built into, in my belief, what is human nature. And I think technology as we define it today, it's gadgets. But if we look at history, across ancient history, technology comes in different definitions. And I think what we need to do is start adapting new language to describe the technology that is nature-based, that is healthy, that is good, and the technology that's not. Я думаю, что я согласен с этой позицией. I agree with the position. Но очень важно понять, где наша интенция, где наше сознание. But we have to understand where is our conscious and where is our intentions. Если я изучаю языки, то мое сознание на языках. If I, for example, learn languages, my conscious is in the languages. Если я занимаюсь движением, if I learn movements, my conscious is in movements. Если я живу в мире чувств, If I live in the world of senses, my world of senses gets bigger. Это абсолютно объективная позиция. It's absolutely objective position. Нейрофизиологические исследования показывают, что у нас усложняется нейронная структура, отвечающая за эти процессы. Physiological researches show that our neural structures becomes bigger after learning. Поэтому вопрос нашего желания и нашей интенции. And that's the question of our desire and our intentions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Hey. Well done.